What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network here for a reading of the breathtaking The Ethics of Money Production by Jörg Guido Hultzmann, published by the Mises Institute. Thank you very much to both of them. Today, Chapter 1, Monies. Part 1, The Division of Labor Without Money. To understand the origin and nature of money, one must first consider how human beings would cooperate in a world without money, in a barter world. Exchanging goods and services in such a bartered world confronts the members of society with certain problems. They then turn in monetary exchange as a means for alle alleviating these problems. In short, Money is a partial solution for the problem of barter exchange. But let us look at this in just a little bit more detail. The fundamental law of production is that joint production yields a greater return than isolated production. Two individuals working in isolation from one another produce less physical goods and services than if they coordinate their efforts. This is probably the most momentous fact of social life. Economists such as David Ricardo and Ludwig van Mises have stressed its implications. Even if there are no other reasons for human being to cooperate, that greater productivity of joint efforts tend to draw them together. The, highest, the higher productivity of the division of labor as compared to isolated production is therefore the basis of, of a general law of association. David Ricardo first formulated this law as a law of, co of comparative cost within the context of the theory of foreign trade. Later economists such as Pareto, Eduardo, Salomon, and Mises argued that it was in fact a general law of exchange. Mises coined the expression law of, associative, law of association. Without money, people would exchange their products in barter. For example, Jones would barter his apples against two eggs from Brown. In such a world, the volume of exchange, in other words, the extent of social cooperation, is limited through technological constraints and through the problem of double coincidence of once. Barter exchange takes place only if tra the trading partner has a direct personal need for the good he, has re he receives in exchange. But even, for, but even in those cases in which the double coincidence of ones is given, the goods are often too bulky and cannot be subdivided to accommodate them for, uh, to these needs. Imagine a carpenter trying to buy 10 pounds of flour with a chair. The chair is far more valuable than the flour. So how can the exchange be arranged? Cutting the chair into, say, 20 pieces would not provide him with the object that they are worth just one twentieth of the value of the chair. Rather, such a division of the chair would destroy the entire value. The exchange would therefore not take place. Part 2. The Origins and Nature of Money these problems can be reduced through what has been called indirect exchange. In our example, the carpenter would exchange his chair against 20 ounces of silver and then buy the 10 pounds of flour in exchange for a quarter ounce of silver. The result is that the carpenter's need for flour, which otherwise would have remained unsatisfied, is now satisfied through an additional exchange and the use of a medium of exchange here silver. Thus indirect exchange provides our carpenter with additional opportunities for cooperation with other human beings. It extends the division of labor and it thereby contributes to the material and intellectual and spiritual advancement of each person. In the history of mankind, a great variety of commodities, kettle, shells, nails, tobacco, cotton, copper, silver, gold, and so on, have been used as a media of exchange. In the most developed societies, the precious metals have eventually been preferred to all other goods because their physical characteristics, scarcity, Durability, divisibility, distinct look and sound, homogeneity through space and time, malleability and beauty make them particularly suitable to serve in this function. 
When a medium of exchange is generally accepted in society, it is called money. How does a commodity such as gold or silver turn into a money? This happens through a gradual process in the course of which more and more market participants, each for himself, decides to use gold and silver rather than other commodities in their indirect exchange. Thus, the historical selection of gold, silver, and copper was not made through some sort of a social contract or convention. Rather, it resulted from the spontaneous convergence of many individual choices, a convergence that was prompted through the objective physical characteristics of the precious metal. To be spontaneously adapted as a medium of exchange, a commodity must be desired for its non-monetary services for its own sake and be marketable. That is, it must be wildly bought and sold. The price that are initially being paid for its non-monetary services enable prospective buyers and or to estimate the future price at which one can reasonably expect to resell it. The prices paid for its non-monetary use are, so to speak, the empirical basis for, it, for its use in indirect exchange. It would be extremely risky to buy a commodity for indirect exchange without knowing its past prices. As a consequence, the spontaneous emergence of a medium of exchange is virtually impossible whenever such knowledge is lacking. On the other hand, when it does exist, then there can arise a monetary demand for the commodity in question. The monetary demand then adds to the original non-monetary demand so that the price of the, no of the money commodity contains a monetary component and a non-monetary component. Although in a developed economy, the former is likely to await the latter quite substantially. It is important to keep in mind that the monetary use of a commodity ultimately depends on its non-monetary use. The medieval scholastics called money a res fungibilis et primisu usu consumptibilis, a thing that is fungible and primarily used in consumption. Uh, see Oswald von Nell Breunings Geld, that is money. This insight was anticipated in Aristotle's politics, who placed a great emphasis on the fact that people make money out of a thing that is one of the most useful things anyway, and which can be most conveniently handled. The same point was later a staple of economic thought, see in particular John Law, money and trade consideration. It was in the very nature of money that to be a marketable thing that had its primary use in consumption. Part three, natural monies. We may call any kind of money that con comes, in, comes into use by the voluntary cooperation of acting persons a natural money. The concept of natural money is not much used in the contemporary literature, but it was a venerable tradition in economics. See, for example, William Gouch, A Short History of Paper Money and Banking. To cooperate voluntarily in our definition means to provide mutual support without any violation of others' people property and to enjoy the invi inviolability of one's own property. See Mises' Human Action. The role of private property is as a fundamental institution of human society is, of course, a staple of historical experience and social science. It is also a staple of Christian social thought, rooted in the Sixth and Ninth Commandments. Within the Catholic Church, the popes emphasized that private property must be held inviolable, not out of any juridical dogmatism in favor of the well-to-do, but because the perceived such inviolability to be the first condition to improve the living standards of the masses. 
uh, Pope Leo the Eighth wrote the first and most fundamental principle. Therefore, if one would undertake to alleviate the conditions of the masses, must be the inviol the inviolability of private property. His successors have similarly emphasized the moral character of private property. For example, John the Thirteenth started that private stated that private ownership must be considered as as a guarantee of the essential freedom of the individual and at the same time an indispensable element of the true social order. They upheld this notion knowing full well that property owners are often bad stewards of their assets. They upheld it even in the cases in which the owners do not, as a matter of fact, use their private means to promote the good of all society. And they upheld it in those cases in which the owner did not even have the slightest intention to pursue the common good. In short, the popes championed the distinction between justice and morals, between the right to own property and the moral obligation to make good use of his property. See on this distinction, Thomas Aquinas. A violation of one's moral obligation could not possibly justify the slightest infringement of property rights. Private property is sacred, even if it is abused or not used. That justice, called commutative commands, sacred respect for the division of possessions and forbids invasion of others' rights through the exceeding of the limits of one's own property. But the duty of owners to use their pro property only in the right way to not come under this type of justice. But under other virtues, obligations of which cannot be enforced by legal action. Therefore, they are in the error who asserts that ownership and its right use are limited by the same boundaries. And it is much farther uh, still from the truth to hold that the right to property is destroyed or lost by reason of abuse or non-use. P.S. the uh, 11th. He is quoting Leo the Thirteenth encyclicals Re Rerum Novarum. Generally speaking, the Catholic attitude towards property has two characteristic features. First, each property owner is morally com commanded to use his property as though it were the property of all. Middle class Christians should use their property which with liberal with liberality and rich Christians should use it with magnificence. See Summa Theologica. Mm -hmm. Second, private property rights are derived from the fundamental property rights. The fact that God destined the earth to serve all of mankind. See Rerum Novirandum. Austrian, economics, Austrian economists have placed great emphasis on the fact that private property in the means of production has much more beneficial social effects than coerced commu communal ownership. See, in particular, Mises, socialism. In other words, the destination of the means of production to serve the broad masses is a built-in feature of a free economy on property rights in Christian dogma. See John Paul II. In the case of society in which private property is inviolable, we may speak to the completely free society and its economic aspects may then be called the free market. For a free economy, such an economy is perfectly, if preferred by charity, truly promotes economic and civil progress. See John Paul II in his book, Centimus Annus. The monetary corollary of such a society is, as we have said, natural money, or rather, all the different natural monies that would exist in such a society for there, for there are good reasons to assume that a free society would harbor a variety of different monies, which would all be natural monies in our sense. Notice that natural money is an 
an amenity. <laughs> Notice that natural money is an eminently social institution. There is this is so not only in the sense that it is used in interpersonal exchange, all monies are so used, but also in the sense that they owe their existence exclusively to the fact that they satisfy human needs better than any other medium of exchange. As soon as this is no longer the case, market participants will choose to discard them and adopt other monies. This freedom of choice assures, so to speak, a grassroots democratic selection of the best available monies, the natural monies. When property rights are violated, especially where they are violated in a systematic manner, we may no longer speak of a completely free society. It is possible that natural monies would still be used in such societies, namely to the extent that the violation of property rights do not concern the choice of money. But wherever people are not free to choose the best available monies, a different type of money comes into the existence, forced money. It characterize, its characteristic feature is that it owes its existence to violation of property rights. It is used at least to the extent because superior alternative monies cannot be used without exposing the user to violence. It follows that such monies are tainted from the moral point of view. They may still be beneficial and used in indirect exchange, but they are in any, in any case less beneficial than natural monies because they owe their existence to violations of private property rather than their rel relative superiority in satisfying human needs alone. Gold, silver, and copper have been natural monies for several thousand years in many human societies. The reason is, as we have seen, that their physical characteristics made them more suitable to serve as money than any other commodities. Still, we call them natural monies, not because of their physical characteristics, but because free human beings have spontaneously selected them for that use. In short, one cannot tell on a a priori grounds what the natural money of a society is. The only way to find this out is to let people freely associate and choose the best means of exchange out of all the available alter alternatives. Looking at the historical record, we notice that at most times and at most places, people have chosen silver. Gold and copper too have been used as monies, though to a lesser extent. Part four, credit monies. Natural money must possess two qualities. It must first be all, it must first of all be valued, valuable prior to its monetary use. And it must furthermore be a phys physically suitable to be used in a medium of exchange. At any rate, more suitable than its alternatives. The historical monies we have mentioned so far derive their prior value from their use in consumption even in the case of the precious metals this is so it is true that they are not destroyed in consumption as for example tobacco or cotton but they are nevertheless consumed such as jewelry ornaments and in variety of industrial applications now there are other monies that do not derive their prior value from consumption the most important case are paper money and electronic money, to which we will turn below. But there is also credit money. The subject of the current section, as the name says, credit money, comes into being when financial instruments are being used in indirect exchange. Suppose Ben lends 10 ounces of silver to Mike for one year. And then in exchange, Mike gives an IOU Suppose, for, suppose further that this IOU is a paper note with the inscription I owe to the bearer of this note the sum of 10 ounces payable in January 1st, 2010. Signature. Then Ben could try to use this note as a medium of exchange. This might work and the prospective buyers of this note will also trust that Mike's declaration to pay back the credit as promised. If Mike's reputation is good with certain people, 
then it is likely that these people will accept his note as payable for their goods and services. Mike's OU, IOU then turns into credit money. Credit money can never have a circulation that matches the, cir the circulation of all natural monies. The reason is that it characterizes the risk of default. Cash exchanges provide in immediate control over the physical money, but the issuer of an IOU might go bankrupt, in which case the IOU would just be a slip of paper. Not surprisingly, therefore, credit money has reached wider circulation only when the credit was denominated in terms of some commodity money, when the reputation of the issuer was beyond doubt, and when it was only and it was the only way to quickly provide the government with the funds needed to conduct large-scale war. This was, for example, the case for the American Continentals that financed the War of the Independence with the French Assignats uh, that financed the wars of the French Revolution against the rest of Europe. In the early days, credit money has also been issued in the other forms than paper money, in particular IOUs made out of the leather leather have been repeatedly used as money starting in the 19th century. See Rupert J. Ederner's The Evolution of Money. Credit money is only a derivative kind of money. It receives its value from an expected future redemption into some commodity. In this respect, it crucially differs from paper money, which is valued for its own sake. And, it, and this brings up the next topic, paper money and the free market. So far, we have singled out the, the precious metals to illustrate our distinct discussion because historically, the precious metals have been the money of the free market. And also because of the present day, no other commodities seem to be more suitable to be used as media of exchange. But the contention that gold, silver, and copper are the best available monies seems to be contradicting, contradicted by the fact that today there is virtually no country in the world that uses precious metals as money. Rather, all countries use paper monies. Paper money must not be confused with credit money made out of paper, but which or with money certificates made out of paper. The latter can be redeemed into commodity money. The former cannot. Note that economists have used the expression paper money both in the narrow sense in which we use it here in, and in a larger sense, which covers paper money in the narrow sense as well as the credit money and paper certificates for money. This universal practice seems to have the ready explanation in the observation that paper money is even more advantageous than the precious metals for all, all least three reasons. Its cost of production are far lower. Its quantity can be easily modified to suit the need for trade. And its quanti quantity can be easily modified to stabilize the value of the money unit. Before we turn to analyzing these alleged advantages in more detail, we have to deal with even more fundamental questions of whether paper money is a market phenomenon in the first place. Uh, does it owe its existence to the free choice of the money user or to its legal privileges? If the former is the case, there seems to be no fault with paper money, quite to the contrary. But if it exists only due to the compulsion and coercion, that is, due to the violation of property rights, its alleged advantage must be examined very carefully. Now, if we turn to the empirical rec record, we confront the stark fact that in no period of human history has paper money spontaneously emerged on the free market. A good overview is in John E. Crow uh, Cho's A History of Money. See also uh, George Selgin's on ensuring the acceptability of a new fiat money, Journal of Money and Credit. And Kevin Doubt, The Emergence of Fiat Money, A Reconsideration. No Western writer before the 18th century seems to have even considered that the existence of paper money was possible. 
The idea arose only when paper certificates for gold and silver gained a large circulation, especially in the context of large-scale government finance. Note that the Bank of England was established in 1694, a few years after the creation of the Bank of Sweden. Probably, it was the French philosopher Montesquieu who first held that the pure sign money, or as he called it, the ideal money, was po possible. However, he thought that anything but real money, commodity monies, would invite uh, abuses and opinions shared by many later illustrated economists such as David Ricardo, Ludwig van Mises. And expection, an exception was James Stewart, who actually endorsed a pure money of account. In the 18th and 19th and 20th century, various experiments with paper money have been taken place in the West. Governments have issued paper money as long along with the legal obligations for each citizen to accept it with legal tender. They overrode the st uh, stipulations made in private contracts and forced creditors, say, to accept paper, uh, payments in paper, greenbacks, rather than in gold or silver. In most cases, however, governments have transformed pre previously existing paper certificates for gold and silver into paper money by outlawing the use of gold and silver and of all other suitable commodities and certificates. The experience of other cultures and times tells the same story. Paper money has been introduced in China in the 12th century equally through compulsion and coercion by the ruler. See Jonathan Williams in Money, a History. In all known historical cases, paper money has come into existence through government-sponsored breach of contract and other violations of private property rights. It has never been the creation of the free market. The historical record does not, of course, provide a decisive verdict on a question whether paper money can spontaneously emerge on the free market. Can we settle the issue on theoretical grounds? Here, the following consideration comes into play. By its very nature, paper money provides the only monetary system, whereas commodity monies provides two kinds of system, monetary and community services, a uh, commodity services. It follows that the price paid for paper money can shrink to zero, whereas the price of commodity money will always be pos positive as long as it attracts a non-monetary demand. If the price paid for a paper money falls to zero, then this money can never be re-monetized again because, of sh uh, because short of an already existing uh, pricing system, the market participants could not evaluate the money units. Thus, the use of paper money uh, carries the risk of total pr uh, permanent value annih annihilation. The risk does not exist in the case of commodity money, which always carries a positive price in which there in which it can therefore always be re-monetized. It does not take much fantasy to predict that practical implications of this fact. In a truly free market, paper money could not withstand the competition of commodity monies. The more uh, far-sighted and prudent market participants would get rid of the paper money first, and the others would follow in due course. At the end of this process, which could be consumed, which put, which could be uh, con, consummated, consummated, in but a few seconds, but which would be conceivably also last last a few years, the paper currency would be completely eradicated. See Hultzmann, Logik der Währungskonkurrenz, and that is the logic of monetary competition. Great book, by the way. The preceding analysis leads to the conclusion that no money can remain in circulation only because it has been in circulation up to now. The ultimate source of its value, the rock bottom of its value, must be something else than the mere fact so far. People have been willing to accept it. Uh, see Benjamin Anderson, The Value of Money.
All kinds of psychological motivations might provide such a source uh, for a while, but they will all collapse under the pressure of substitution processes of all kinds we have described above. What then? Can the armed power of the government keep money in circulation? The government's fiat can indeed confer value on the paper money, the value of not getting into trouble with the police. George Holzbauer argues that the value of paper money was ultimately rooted in the fact that government forced its citizen to use those paper slips to pay taxes, if thus had a tax foundation. But this observation only confirms our point that paper money is not a market phenomenon. It cannot flourish in the fresh air of a free society. It is used only when police power suppresses its competitors so that the members of society are given to stark choice of either using the government's paper money or foregoing the benefits of a monetary economy altogether. Below, we will examine whether fiat paper money is viable in the long run and how it stands up to the most moral standards. Now, part six, electronic money, electronic money. The preceding observations can be directly applied to the case of electronic money, an economic good that is defined entirely in terms of bits and bytes is un unlikely ever to be produced spontaneously on a free market for the very same reasons that were just discussed in the case for paper money. And despite the dedication, the dedicated efforts of various individuals and associations, no such money has in, has in fact ever, by the way, that book was written in 2007, been produced since the creation of the internet made electronic payments possible. Oh, I love that. <laughs> At present, only government money has been produced in electronic form. And as in the case of paper money, governments could do this only because they have the possibility to suppress competition. On the free market, the new information technologies have been unable to create any new monies. They have been able to uh, develop various new instruments to access and transfer money. These new electronic techniques of dealing with money are very efficient and beneficial, but they must not be confused with the creation of electronic money. Pierce, that was a very good chapter. Thank you very much for joining me here. And thank you very much again to Professor Dr. Jörg Guido Hultzmann and to the Mises Institute for this outstanding work. Uh, and again, Thank you very much and see you on the next reading. Bye-bye.